Welcome back to Guests on the Mecca, and in today's episode, we are discussing the unskippable openings of 2022. Yeah, we're back. Happy New Year. And we're going to discuss openings like I pledge to do every single year. As you may know, each year we do what I call an unskippable openings show. Um, this is the third annual version in which I talk about some of the openings that just really caught my attention in the year. Before you do get into the show though, as always, when there is a review, I like to read it out to um, show my appreciation. And this time we have a review from Phoenix. Um, Phoenix is a long time listener of the show and friend of the show as well. If you love learning about the behind the scenes of your favorite anime and the ins and outs of animation, animators and directors that work on them, then Jamal has you covered. From Mecha to Supernatural to Slice of Life, Jamal talks about it all in a way that's easy to understand. Thank you very much, Phoenix, for your review. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I will be also linking the YouTube channel and podcast in the description as well. Go check that out. Again, friend of the show, the anime T. Um, so yeah, let's get into the podcast for this week. A look into the unskippable openings of 2022. Just to precast this before we dive into things, the main thing I want to say is that this episode is not like an award show. These aren't the best openings from 2021. However, what I do want to kind of do is, of course, give praise to the ones that I really liked and talk about what I really enjoyed about them. That being said, I haven't... There are some openings which I really like that I'm just not going to mention in this show, partially because I've also recognized these shows already or just for other reasons. And also I have... For the sake of being a bit more genuine, there are some shows which I haven't watched, but I like the OP. I decided to just not talk about those because I feel like that just wouldn't be very nice since, yeah, uh, <laughs> what's really the point of doing that when I don't really understand the context behind them? So with that being said, here are three openings which I really liked from 2021. First is probably one you could maybe expect from me as a very long time Yamashita fan. And so this is Jujutsu Kaisen opening two. The song for this is Vivid Vice by Huyo Extended. And as I just said before, this is storyboarded and directed by Shinko Yamashita. Often when discussing Yamashita's work, the compositing is the main thing that's mentioned. And I completely agree with that. The compositing on this opening is beautiful. By compositing, I mean like the, not necessarily the color work, but how it's all textured and just the way that overall polish and look that's given to the opening. And I guess the main thing that I think wows a lot of people and still wows me is the fact that Yamashita has a lot of range when it comes to, of course, being a really great animator, being a incredible director, and also being really great at photography work. As a director of photography, the compositing work is what makes the Yamashita opening feel alive in a lot of cases. Or, or is it? And that's what I want to dive into when talking about opening two for Jujutsu Kaisen. And what I really believe manages to elevate these openings and makes it a quintessentially Yamashita opening is the portrayal of nature and the natural elements that feature in this opening. This is what underpins the vast majority of his directorial stuff. When you look to, of course, the Shinsuke Yori ED, the use of water, and so on. When we go to his other stuff as well, it's all about nature. And that's what really makes it his, to be honest, because he shows us the beauty of it. Uh, I, I think I should maybe clarify that a bit more. And of course, nature is something that anybody can tap into, but I think Yamashita does it in a way in which unveils its almost sublimity and, again, the beauty of it. Some of the examples in which I really like are stuff like the bubble and the drop of water that's caught in motion. I, there was a whole interview on Crunchyroll, I'll link it in the show notes, essentially where he's talking about that bubble cup which is animated by a really great animator known as Renon Dara and essentially that they did a bunch of referencing and stuff like that but essentially the movement isn't actually possible. However, I think what's really interesting about that in itself is how Yamashita takes pushes nature to its limit 
limits. He shows it, it doing things that are essentially impossible and teaches us what this is capable of. And as a result, that reflects in the show as well and what the opening is trying to say about the show. In this case, it's Yuji's power, I guess, and just the the the, na- the power that exists in the, this city in which he's depicting. As for the drop of water, that really speaks to Yuji's speed uh, and the whole thing on rhythm and this whole discourse and rhythm that's existent in this part of the anime. The second cut has a lot to do with the Black Flash and mastering this perfect timing and, and almost beats in order to attack your opponent. And by showing this drop of water that's essentially caught in motion, he says a lot about how, again, quick he is. And it kind of reflects or it, it bounces off nicely from opening one, which has a very similar effect with Sukuna's finger nicely drifting in the water for a few seconds. What I also just find really great about both these openings combined, I might as well talk a bit about opening one, is how he uses water in all these different ways. And I think that's that's partially what I really love about Yamashita. It's not just using the beauty of nature, but it's using very specific parts in very different ways to tell very different stories. In this case, again, Sukuna's finger has a very different connotation to the drop of water on speed or the bubble and so on. And so he can use one thing in so many different ways to tell many different stories. And I just find that really masterful and it blows me away every time. This is kind of just a bit of a side point, but I don't know about Yamashita's views when it comes to climate and the environment, but I'd be very curious to know because it's getting to the point which it's an inevitable part of his openings. And so I really want to know how that kind of came about. It, unfortunately, it wasn't in the Crunchyroll interview, at least that I don't think there was any specific question about that was very constrained to that specific opening itself rather than his career in general, which is a bit of a shame because I'd really like to know that but I it, this opening kind of just increase well it, it's just another addition to this whole narrative of Yabashita using nature and stuff and just increases my intrigue as to what they can really do and I guess we kind of did see this in the most recent Osama ranking opening but that's a whole nother thing for next year when I will probably be talking about that as well. move on to the second opening and this is a bit of a wild card maybe not a wild card for those that listen to the show but a bit of a wild card in terms of I I haven't seen this one on many people's these are the openings that I liked list but this is one that's kind of grown on me over time because of how perhaps different it is and this is the One Direct Priority OP and this the song for that is Sudachino Uta by Anemoneria this is storyboarded by Shin Wakabayashi and Jin Oyama, and it is directed by Oyama. Again, I haven't really seen this in the highlights list, and I kind of understand why, but at the same time, I think it's it's really unique relative to the other openings that I really liked. Again, some of them won't feature on this episode. What this really feels like is the actual show itself. This opening is very realist in its approach in how it or on the most part, looks like the actual show itself. I know that sounds a bit weird, but when we really think of it, if we look at, say, the Jujutsu Kaisen opening, um, that is not how the show looks, or at least it's it's largely different. It's not composited in the same way. Yeah, everything probably looks a bit cleaner. The, the color design's pretty different. But in the case of this Wonder Egg opening, it feels very much the same. Of course, when it comes to the cuts and so on, you're not going to get that because it's an opening and not an actual episode in the show itself. However, I, I'd say that this is the closest thing you get to the show that isn't actually the show. Besides maybe that there's some small breaks with some real life photography here and there, but overall it, it, it feels like you're watching the show just in the form of an opening. What I find really refreshing about this opening is how it's literally a sequence of everyday activities. I goes on the train, and Momo is also on the train, she goes to the shopping mall and Rika's at the shopping mall. She also passes Nehru on, on the street. Um, I is also taking care of her plants at the beginning. It's very, quote, normal, but 
chopped up into a sequence. And I, I think this really lends itself to talking about adolescence in this show. As I've tried to make the case for multiple times, Wonder Egg Priority really concerns itself with adolescence. That is really, I'd say, the main theme of the show. What does it mean to be an adolescent per se? And by showing these everyday activities, it taps into that very idea uh, to show what adolescence is. Uh, the thing is, I think it's tempting to say that this opening is quite deceiving because it doesn't show us about what this show is, quote, really about. And by showing us, you know, the monsters and everything that's involved in the show. However, it I wouldn't say it's deceiving. I'd say it's exactly what it's about. It's about the lives of adolescents and what we learn from the wonder eggs and so on in the actual show itself are what we're seeing right here. We're learning about how they live their lives and the decisions they've made. And that's just reflected in the opening. A pretty critical component, I'd say of a, not, not all openings, not all, but I'd say a vast amount of openings or a good amount of them would be there's usually a section in which is trying to really grab your attention it's the chorus of the song usually it's it's that moment it's that click it's a really good use of chorus essentially and because that that is you know the climax of the song it's the climax of the event in the opening it's all synchronized together very well in the case of the wonder egg opening though i'd say that that is kind of shifted to the start where we have these piano notes there are about three of them i believe not four and that is where i think the emotion runs high and that's the attention grab it really sets the tone for this anime it's essentially that we're a serious show we're a serious show talking about serious things and that is what really gets my attention for this opening and i just found that a really interesting choice of doing things rather than you know having that middle point but in fact we have a beginning point it's an instant hook i'd say it's a musical one but it's one that i think is still very cool and yeah that's what i really liked about this opening from that perspective there's also another thing which i really liked when watching this and it's how it's laid out so again this is another structural point and it's it's how you have the opening basically starting with the eye opening her eyes and basically sort of waking up arguably and then you know she goes through her journey she passes people along the way the main cast and then at the end we kind of have the sun I, I believe it's either setting or rising I'm still not sure about this I believe it's setting that would make a lot of sense in, in the sense that she'd have like a full day to do things and then the sun sets at the end but we have this moment where she's at the park end or just somewhere she's on like a high point of elevation and then you see the sun sort of glow on her face and I really love that whole it's about this again thing on daily life and very similarly to the egg which is the main metaphor of this show the girls are essentially eggs that hatch and very similarly to when you enter adolescence you're in this crazy wild world of emotions and hormones <laughs> and other things and you kind of have to deal with that almost again like you've popped out of an egg and popped out of your shell and so I think the structure of this opening really reflects the very central topic and metaphors in this show. On to our final opening for this year's edition of Unskippable Openings, and that is the Odd Taxi OP, which is the the song for that is Odd Taxi, no surprises, by Skirt and Pumpy, and that is storyboarded and directed by Roji Yamada. I very vaguely spoke about this in my episode about the anime, but I really wanted to build on those thoughts a bit more because it's something that I didn't really get to cover in detail and it's something that throughout the year ever since I watched Odd Taxi has been it, it I can still remember Odd Taxi very fondly and it's kind of still resonating within me I'm still trying to process everything and the opening is one of those things so I want to maybe like get a bit of closure in this week's episode. I want to preface this by saying that 
I watched most of this show on TV in the dark, and I I don't know why I always say this, but I think it was it's worth saying because I believe that it kind of elevated my experience quite a lot when watching this, and I, I'm glad I did. Honestly, watching it in this way really made the opening pop much more, and in a way that I don't think I'd be able to experience if I was you know just watching it on my phone or just watching it on my laptop or something like that. All the colors from like the very limey. Greens and the very lemony yellows. I know these are very like cheesy ways of talking about colors, but like the blues and everything, it contrasts all very nicely. And I think that says a lot about the diversity of the city in this anime.、Um, something we spoke about when we did that episode on what Odd Taxi says about society. We spoke about this notion of the diversity of the city and how, of course, cities are places in which are filled with all these different types of people, personalities, and ideas. But in a way, I kind of find this message a bit deceiving in the opening because, of course, a primary thing about Odd Taxi is how we are connected, and I, I think in this case, the the differences are kind of mistaken for being almost individualist and. We are completely separate and atomized beings as a result, and that's what's really damaging. And Odd Taxi is kind of this.、Uh, I don't want to say critique because I don't know if that's really the right word, but it definitely shows us what's wrong with holding this、uh, very extreme individualist mentality. And the city is kind of a stage for that, and so the opening really represents that. And it's quite funny how, of course, you know, you see these bright colors and so on. And I'd say that feels a bit deceiving because. You know this commentary is pretty dark, or at least it's it's not as nice as it seems to be putting off、uh, at first glance. Anyway, the way we interact with each other in the case of Odd Taxi is almost fundamentally flawed in a lot of ways, and and it shows this and comments on it. Be it the very parasocial relationships we engage with when it comes to the internet. The very individualist and alienating culture that I spoke about before that's very prominent in our cities, and then of course you get the other side of things, which is how we get all these elements morphing into each other.、Uh, Basically, the whole opening is that is essentially it's the city morphing into people or these animals, the animals morphing into the next scene and so on, and it's all connected together. And so I think the odd taxi opening is really great and really a great place to end this episode because it, it it's what I think all openings should aspire to be in some regard, in the sense that it reflects. What the show is not. It doesn't need to directly spell out what the show is and what's going to happen, but it tells us almost everything we need to know in that one minute thirty seconds. It it's all the ideas injected into that short space of time. And what I think is super magical about this, in the case of Odd Tax, is that I think you only really understand that message once you finish the show itself. And you've really dug into what our taxi means, and hence the opening gains even more value. This is a piece of commentary on the show, as much as it is just a bit of a bumper before getting into the episode. And I think that leads us nicely into some takeaways. So let's get into those. The big message that I have this year about openings. And the big thing I would like for you to take away from this podcast is the fact that openings are stories within themselves, and I, I would really try to depart from the idea that they are simply things that had that come before the episode. They're just again that bumper before getting to, into the show. It's not just a bit of space, and I'd say it's more than just a credit sequence as well.、Um, I, I'd say that's I don't say that's just as reductionist. I'd say the credits are probably the more important. Important part of the opening, beyond just having a bit of entertainment and time to get into the episode, but I'd say it's it's an opportunity for artists to really add value to the show and comment on it. Recently, I've been using this example of openings being kind of like guest posts for a blog or being a guest writer. They have their own experiences and ideas, and they tell a story. In that one minute and thirty seconds near the start, and as a result, can have a really profound impact on the show, and can add a whole new layer of commentary onto it. In this case, Roji Yamada or Yamashita kind of are the guest posters in this analogy. Yamashita introduces this idea of nature to comment on the power. 
of the multiple people within the show. And Roji Yamada kind of embeds this whole notion of connection and diversity and has a bit of a discussion in the case of this one minute 30 seconds. I think some of the coolest openings like again Yamada's opening for Odd Taxi or Yamashita's opening for Jujutsu Kaisen what they're really able to do is they're able to get their foot in the door they're able to say something perhaps a bit more different to the show itself or unique and hence they make the show even deeper than it already is which I only see as a positive thing. It's their interpretation of the ideas and I'm never really against seeing another artist add their own interpretation to a pre-existing work as we see all the time or, or at least on many bases uh, with the way TV anime works essentially with the storyboard artists and episode directors coming in most episodes or at least it's usually alternating and changing they add and even animation directors as, we, as we've discussed they alternate and add their own take to the narrative and openings are no different to this. It's just simply done in a different format and different way of doing so which also opens up so many different opportunities. That being said I wouldn't fall for the idea that they are completely disconnected stories either as we've kind of discussed but they're really a different form of commentary. I don't think you can separate the opening from the show. The opening, uh, yes you can say the opening is good and the show isn't good. That's not really what I'm trying to say. That's basic logic however I I don't think you can disconnect the messages between the two and this is just an opening for fun and this is just the rest of the show this is the meat and this is the side dish no the two are interconnected and you can't really separate the two because they ha they both comment on one another essentially the messages of the show we use for interpreting the opening and what the ideas we get from the opening kind of affect our view of the show as well so it's this really interesting two-way flow going on between the opening and the show itself and the same can be said for endings as well in this case of course the main difference is the fact that the rules and principles which guide an opening are very different to something like a TV show which often follows a bit more continuity usually not always but you know the openings obviously a bit more there are a lot less rules and stuff when it comes to sort of filmmaking it's much more discontinuous and loose kind of like a music video so you can that that's what allows it to do all these very different things and explore some really profound ideas in a very short space of time and of course you have the other advantage which we didn't quite discuss in this episode being the lyrical commentary the uh, main reason I cut that out was because we would be here for a very long time if I was to discuss lyrics on top of all of these things or I just simply wouldn't be able to get enough analysis on a very specific thing which I wanted to hone in on but although we didn't discuss that that's obviously something to take note of too the words also have impact on the opening and our understanding of the show assuming you pay attention to it of course the language barrier makes it a bit difficult but if you of course look into it you do your reading you can actually learn a lot and really take some really rich stuff out of the show beyond just the literal dialogue in the show itself. So to kind of end it all here, openings open up loads of great opportunities for artists to really explore th what this show means to them and these openings I think are really great examples of this and I also think the best ones capture the essence of the show without literally spelling out what the show is or there's no need to do so again it comes down to interpretation and the ones that really take these elaborate interpretations of the show I think often create the best openings because they're attacking it from a different point of view and their own point of view and uh, that's what we re that that's usually where I, I would say the best anime in general comes from just a very unique vision and attack on something. I'm sure this has been said many many times before on podcasts or YouTube videos or wherever but I, I have to reiterate on the behalf of everybody who has said this that openings are an art in themselves and they really deserve to be respected and appreciated Again, they're an art in themselves and they really shouldn't be viewed as a side piece to the main show, but an integrated part of it. That being said, thank you for listening to another episode, uh, an episode that has been meaning to come for a very long time. This was supposed to come up probably about two weeks ago. 
uh, or something much sooner. But apologies for that. And thank you for listening. Thank you if you didn't forget who I was. <laughs> um, and yeah, all the support is very appreciated. If you would like to support this podcast, the main thing you can do that I say all the time is you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you do get your podcasts if they have reviews but the main place and the one that helps the most is always apple podcast as well as spotify i forgot about that because they also did that and of course all the other things as well i don't really need to say them just like subscribe on youtube um and share the podcast with other people that you really like who, who you think might like anime discussions like this that are maybe a bit more deep I, I really hate calling this show deep, but um, the, yeah, <laughs> um, that's a great time to end this podcast. So thank you for listening. I will hopefully see you much sooner on another episode of Get in the Mecca. The music in this episode goes as follows. Chill Wave 3, Adventure Time Revision, On the Road Again, Mastered, and Synthwave by Alex, and all of this music is done by Alex McCulloch and is under the public domain. I thought I'd just throw in a few post-credit notes here again like I did last time. This is nothing to do with the um, actual contents of the show itself. I think, if I'm correct, almost everything's accurate. The one thing that I did say that might have been slightly inaccurate was um, on the piano notes for the Wonder Egg opening, there are three of those. I just went to check. I said three or four. So just to confirm, three. But the other thing I wanted to say was just, um, I, I know it was a bit, I, I kind of just left for about a month and w without much explanation or at least on the podcast feed and so I just wanted to throw that in here just you know for a bit of transparency's sake and because I kind of didn't want to stuff it all in the opening or at least in the opening of the episode because I know at least in the video version uh, everyone drops off then so <laughs> um, I just wanted to reduce that as much as possible but the reason for that um, is a few things one of them was I was just you know sorting out my life um, I'm a student and stuff and things get really intense at times and so that's usually what leads to like these fluctuations in the podcasting schedule. Another thing is, and this is one of the main reasons, it's the fact that I actually broke one of my lights. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter you would know this but just for those that don't, I, I usually use one softbox and I basically broke the softbox. Well not the, not the softbox itself but the bulb that goes in. I accidentally smashed the only one that I had here and so I had to buy new lights and stuff so that took some time and yeah, it was just about the day I was going to record the podcast that happened. And then the time when I actually recorded the podcast, this is where it gets even worse, is that I, um, I managed to record the whole thing without audio because I didn't check on OBS properly whether I was recording my audio and my audio interface. So I did a whole thing without it. And that really sucked, honestly. So I took a bit of a delay between them and came back refreshed and did this episode again. And, and to be, fa to be fair, I think this episode is much better than the one I initially did. I think it's much more to the point. And I, the, at least the video version, I think is pretty up to scratch for at least my standards. So thank you very much for putting up with this delay, hopefully. And I, I really do hope, I know I said this with the Heike video and how I took a really like long pause, but I really hope that I'm not delaying much longer than like a month. I, I really don't want this, but it does happen from time to time. So um, thank you for understanding. Thank you for supporting the show, even by just listening, uh, especially after this long break. It really does mean a lot. And yeah, I'll catch you on the next episode. Thank you for sticking around if you actually listen to these post-credit notes.